All right, um, good evening or good afternoon, everybody. We are here to commemorate uh, the late uh, comrade and commander, um, Zwandlem Tsoseli, uh, who died in 1990, um, in June, was it the 21st of June? Um, in Cape uh, Provincial Leadership um, decided that we meet here today to relive um, the memory of his life and bring it to life. And I am here with the commander who worked, Comrade Mzwantle Mkoseli, Comrade George Beer. I am also here with the Comrade Bulalo here with whom they worked uh, together in uh, Port Elizabeth, you know, since the time he joined as a port, as well as the time that uh, they went out of the country into exile. Um, so as we wait uh, for you to come in, let us um, take a listen to some of the songs that he used to sing uh, with his cadres in the revolution at the time. Tulele mama Tulele mama Goma se file mina Goma se file mina Sempre la luna Sempre la luna Dice la che luna e azani Yeah, I'm my
us um, by way of welcoming you to this um, momentous occasion uh, in memory of our comrade and our fallen hero, comrade um, Zwandile Mtoseli. And at this moment, I want to uh, plead with you to lower your heads as we are about to sing a song that is solemn in the history and the life of Azanla. We are going to be singing the Azanla National Anthem. Uh, as we all know that Mzwandile um, Mkoseli was a commander in Azanla and uh, responsible for logistics. And he was uh, the supreme logistics commander of Azanla and died in that position. It is only fitting that we remember him through and start his program through a song that was always solemn in his life. So I am asking you to join us as we sing the national anthem of Azanla Ingoma Zamasot. <laughs> Um, I wish to welcome you back to this commemoration service. As I indicated, we are here to commemorate the arms <laughs> of our hero, uh, Comrade Mzwandile Mtoseli, 
As you would uh, recall, um, Comrade Mzwandile died on the 21st of June in 1990. He hails from Port Elizabeth, and that is where he was buried. He was the platoon logistics um, commander of our Zandla forces. We are here with uh, one of his um, combatants and uh, fighters, um, Comrade Mbulelo Keke and uh, Comrade uh, George Beer. I am going to be handing over to Comrade Mbulelo to share with us, um, you know, the perspective about the life that he lived uh, while he was a member of Azapo before he decided uh, to give his all uh, to the life of struggle when he decided to join our Azanla forces. And later on, after which uh, I will then invite uh, the Commander General, uh, Comrade uh, George Beer, to give us uh, his um, uh, perspective on the life that he lived whilst they were together in exile. Over to you, Comrade uh, Keke. Uh, thank you, Comrade Facilitator, Comrade Ashe. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. And uh, a very special and emotional one. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to start this commemoration by giving you a small background about Zandile. To the family of Mtosevi, Komri Kuki Mtosevi, and Mrs. Irene Mtosevi Blow, sister Komri Kuki, the elder one, and Andile and Ayanda, the two sons that Comrade Zwandile was blessed with. To the Eastern Cape leadership of Azapo, led by Comrade Wingin Mabisa, the national leadership of Azapo under the President Strike Tugwane, former President Jacob Tigobo, the stalwarts and veterans of our movement, Azapo, Comrade Musibudi Mangena, Comrade Twix Klipu, Comrade Seth Cooper, Comrade Busen Koku, Comrade John Gadimeng, Comrade Pandelani Nepolo Hodwe. To the youth and students of our movement, the Zayo Azasko, Amakama of the late Comrade Mundumiesa, I would say, Eitada. We also convey a special message of support to Comrade Peter Jones, who's not well down in the, there in Cape Town. We all wish Comrade Jones a speedy recovery. Molweni Dumelang, Tobe. Zwanile Mtoseli is the son of Joseph Mtoseli, Uchadebe, and Mrs. Diteka Mtoseli, Umamzocho. The family was removed from Salisbury near Mount Pleasant in Port Elizabeth in the 40s during the forced removal. And they were dumped in a small house or houses called two rooms in Guazakel. They were blessed with seven children. The first one being Ruben, followed by Tamsanga, followed by Arim, Nundumiso, Muruleko, Zwandile, and Kuki, the last four. Only Irene and Kuki are surviving, and the rest of the Mtoseli children have since passed on. That is the genome, the genome of Mtose, Zwandile, the Keida. Zwandile Timothy Mtoseli was born on the 12th April 1959 in Port Elizabeth. He started his primary school at Mzomcha Primary School and went on to complete his high school at Loiso High. He then got employed at Howard and Young in Dilpati until the mid 80s when the violence in the township, particularly the feud 
made it difficult for him to go to work. He joined Azapo possibly late 1983, early 1984. It's difficult to pinpoint the exact date because his home was gutted by fire in the conflict that took place in Port Elizabeth. So it's not possible to get the proper details of his exact joining. Or possibly his documents were confiscated by the security police who had an, a tendency to invade our homes and confiscate documents. I raise this matter because those days with, uh, uh, without a membership card, Zwandle would not have been a member. So he was a member of the Zapo. He joined it around that time. The Port Elizabeth branch of Zapo, which was formed in 1983, had a culture of meetings. Every Wednesday, there was a general meeting, usually held at a classroom, school, or a home of a comrade. Most of these meetings rotated around all the township of Port Elizabeth, be it New Brighton, Zwide, red location, white location, and everywhere, and, and, and warmer sometimes. But the majority of these meetings took place around Njoli because the majority of members of Azapo at the time were concentrated in Njoli. Comrade Zwani stayed not far from Njoli. He stayed in Zwide. And he wanted meetings to also take place at Zwide. He then organized people around his area every Thursday of the week to have what he called political discussions. And the leadership of the branch of Azapo was invited to come and conduct leadership and political discussion at these meetings at Mzwandilem Tosili's home at number 78 Bertram Street. These meetings that he organized at his home grew leaps and bounds, and they overshadowed the general meetings of Wednesdays because the concentration was on the new members that Zwandile was bringing to the organization. In 1984, during the busy week, which we usually held on the 6th of September to the 12th of September. We met as a branch to draw the program for the BC week. Now the venues for BC week usually were the Great Centenary Hall in New Brighton, Kana Kakosa uh, at the Methodist Church, and St. Stephen's. Zwandi Lemtoseli in that week introduced a new area where the business week must start. And he made an argument that the branch agreed. He organized together with the late comrade Zoli Lechisa the opening of the Black Consciousness Week in an area next to Fear Plus. There was no much like it then, there was still up and coming. In Fear Plus, the community hall there was called Sisonke Community Hall. It was the first time <clears throat> that Azapo had a meeting, held a meeting at Sisonke Community Hall. The meeting was a success. The hall was full. Zwandile had organized the school, he had organized the community, he had organized workers. It is then that the leadership of Azapo, the, of the branch in PE, started to take note of the capabilities of Mzwani. But the, by, by the middle of 1984, there was a political turmoil in Port Elizabeth. There was a rejection of the Bantu advisory councils, the normal councillors today, 
There was a crisis in education. There was a crisis of forced removal. The people of Warma and Soweto in Port Elizabeth threatened with removal. And the Zapo was involved in all these activities. Zwandile organized the branch of Zapo to go and demonstrate in support of non-removal of the people of Soweto. Through that activity, we gained membership in Soweto, an area we normally uh, didn't exist before. Dwandile was an organizer in that sense. Because if, of this war, of this turmoil uh, that took place in 84, Azapo PE branch used to give direction to the activities of, that, of those days, like the stairways, uh, the school boycotts, which were abused by the other section of the liberation movement, and the Zapo tried to give a revolutionary content to these tools of struggle. That invited anger towards Azapo. By the end of 1984, they toy toy around the system and subsystem was now directed against Azap. So Azap had now to be on the defensive. By the middle of 1985, <coughs> Azapo, what is the branch, found themselves in a place we used to call then the base at Masangwana because of the attacks that were now directed towards Azar. At the base, we were with parents whose homes were destroyed. We were with comrades who could not go to school, students. We were with comrades who were working. The environment was not conducive. Zwandile was a pillar of strength. Zwandile mobilized for defense. Zwandile organized food when there was no food in the base. Zwandile organized for students. He was a pillar of strength in that base in Masangwa. As a result of his uh, leadership, There was a committee formed called a high command. Zwandile did not refuse to take part when he was called to be member of the high command. He declined in favor of his brother, Unkululeko, who had since joined us at the base as a member of Azar. And the high command its function was to organize for all the necessities of the people in the base. This was as a result of his attempt to keep the morale and the spirits of comrades together in a very difficult situation. In early 1986, we had to change from the base in Masangwana. We went to Gratin, number seven. The reason was that there, was, there were differences of opinion uh, arising now in the place where we're in. So a Zappo branch, P branch, took a decision to relocate. We went to stay at number seven, Gratin. Without telling the leadership of a Zappo P branch, Zwandile in the evening organized a few companies. One of them is the late German Kazi and the late Fuzile, the poor. They knocked every house next to the base, the entire street and the next door street, to tell the community that Azapo has arrived, it's staying here at number seven. And in a subtle way, 
indicated to the community that we're not coming to cause trouble and we will expect no trouble from the community. Although this was not uh, sanctioned and not very well with some Congress, but it turned out to work better because soon we were safer in that area. In the same area, opposite us, there was a spaza shop run by a family. Zwandile developed a, a friendship with this family to the point that this family donated sugar, bread, and tea when there is a need for us at the base. They were the friends of Zwandile. One of the sons of that family decided to join Azako, even in that situation of conflict in 1986. Around the base, opposite the house where we're staying, there were two old grannies, two old, old, old people. Zwandile observed that these people the grannies or Makulu have no relatives because they are always alone in, the, in their houses. He befriended the two grannies. He became their, their son. He goes to the shop for them. He accompanies them to the clinic. He does everything for them. Sooner, he, he organized fox, spades, and rakes, and wheelbarrows, and took some comrades here to go and clean the yard and the houses of the two grannies. Unfortunately, one of the grannies was too old. After a few months, she passed on. The the relatives of that family who came to the funeral paid tribute to Zwangile at that funeral because apparently Granny had explained to him this new found son, Zwangile. He continued his friendship with the other Granny, the surviving one, and became the son, the husband, and everything to Granny. He virtually stayed there, no longer with us in the base. He just comes once, goes there. Comrade Fanele Mialeni, who was his friend, joined him in accompanying Omaku. This relationship of Zwandile and Maku resulted in the granny going to local authority housing to hand over her house to Fanele when her days come. As a result of that, the house of Granny is now the house of the Yalini family. This is the activity comes one day in the community. It is exactly 30 years now that Mzwandile has since passed on. It is 2020 since he died in 1990. Looking at the political life of our country and the rapid, rapid destruction of his life, as a Zapo, we must ask ourselves, if the death of Mzwandile cannot motivate us to rise, to save the country. Mzwandile fought for liberation. He fought for a free Azania. He fought for a successful Azania. He fought for a, 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 a proper health system. He fought for a quality education. All those things have since collapsed. So for us as a Zappo, 30 years later, 
We must ask ourselves, if it's not time for us to rise in order to save the legacy of Mzondi, the bullet he took for the national liberation must make us rise to the occasion to save the country from total destruction. He had a passion for the philosophy of black consciousness. That's why I explain all the things about, because this is what you do as a black consciousness person. You, you get involved with the community. He really practiced it and leave it to his best. Now the bold decision for him to go into combat expecting anything, including losing his life, meant that he understood still when he wrote. We must remove from our vocabulary completely the concept of fear. In a true bid for change, we have to take off our coats, be prepared to lose our comfort, our jobs and families. A struggle without casualties is no struggle. Indeed, Mzwanile filled this call by Steve. Steve must have been the first to welcome him when he joined the legion of our national martyrs. He was a good soldier of Steve B. Comrade Chair and the leadership of the Eastern Cape, my gratitude goes to you because you gave me a chance of a lifetime that I missed in 1990 at the Daku Hall when Mzwanile's funeral took place. I could not be part of the funeral because the situation did not allow that I attend. My heart was cut into pieces because just two months before his death, I shook his hand to say goodbye to him as we go or went our separate ways. I never imagined that too so soon I may have to say again to him, goodbye. Except that this time around, it was for good and the rest of his life. Because the grave closed the chapter between the two of us. So your invitation for me to say these few words gave me the opportunity for closure. I thank you for that, Alam. These are the only few words I can give you about Mzwanile, because the period under review is effectively from 1984 to 1986, when he left for exile to join the Azanian National Liberation Army. He responded to the call by the BCMA to the people of the country to come and join and swell the ranks of the Azanian Liberation Army. That part of his history, Comrade George Bia, will talk about it shortly. As I close, Comrade Sumpiwe, to the family, once more, Comrade Kuki, says Irene, and the two sons, the brother, your father, was a caring and a compassionate comrade. He always helped comrades and never take any credit for that. He did it honestly and genuinely. He was most often called upon for special assignments that had to be done and everybody knew he would see it through to completion. His service to the people of the country, black people in particular, that ended his life so tragically, is the highest form of patriotism. May his soul rest in peace till Azania Ibuya.
Over to you, Comrade George. <laughs> Mbulelo Kekia giving his uh, testimony on the life of uh, Comrade Mzwandle um, Mtoseli whilst he was still uh, based in Port Elizabeth before he decided to migrate and give his life to the struggle of our land. Uh, I'm now going to be handing over to Comrade uh, uh, Commander General Comrade uh, George Beer uh, so that he can give us an account on the life and times of uh, Comrade Mzwandle Mtosele whilst uh, he was in exile up until the time that uh, he left this earth. It was at uh, his funeral in Port Elizabeth um, where the former president of Azapo, Comrade Tmire Musala, um, uh, told us that uh, Comrade Mtosele died with his dignity in his hand. It is uh, that uh, dignity that uh, Comrade uh, George Beer is going to be talking to us about. He died with his dignity in his hand. Over to you, Comrade uh, Beer. Um, thank you, uh, Comrade Facilitator, Comrade Hashi. Um, let me salute the um, family, the Azapo leadership in Eastern Cape, and uh, the entire leadership and cadership of the movement who are part of this platform. And uh, that uh, I was asked to come and share. When I got that call from Comrade Mapena, I had mixed feelings. Feelings of uh, joy that uh, the story of one of our outstanding cadres, the history and his contribution is finally being recognized. But it was mixed because I've never found closure. And I don't think I will find closure uh, on what happened. But allow me 
uh, comrades to start by laying a background on the, the structure and the environment he joined when he joined Azanla. As um, comrade to say, he, I first met him uh, in 1987 when I came back from Libya to Botswana with a unit that was tasked specifically to go and impart the skills that we had acquired there. When I arrived in Dukwe, I met quite a number of our comrades. Uh, I was with my unit, which was made up of uh, comrade Elias, Carl, Zagane, and Neville. Well, when we arrived, our task was cut, cast in stone. We're told you have to do military training, you have to do uh, physical training. Um, well, in an Azanla environment, we were so structured such that we all operated as units. One had to quickly uh, try to understand and know the units that were there. And um, Comrade was in the and we came to know each other at the level when he was still unit commander and his unit, I knew uh, him as a logistic uh, officer in his unit. And then when uh, we were now units, you, you, you bring together the units, put them into squads, that is three units. And from squads, uh, as a squad, uh, in a squad, he became a logistic uh, officer again. And then when we squads together into a platoon, he became a, a platoon logistics, uh, but he never ended there. What I'm trying to show you is how he was rising with the ranks. He rose very quickly. Within the ranks of commander, he and logistics of Azanda, uh, that is in the military affairs committee. He graduated, he moved step by step with the structures uh, up to that level. But what distinguished him, he rose to the ranks very fast. And why he rose to the ranks very fast is because Comrade Ntuseli was very disciplined. He was six years my senior, but in the cooperation and the discipline he displayed. And it was so inspiring, so, so in fact, just even to us. He was such a disciplinarian, such that you don't do anything wrong uh, under his watch. 
you will call me to order. Um, comrade, yeah, we there's something we're struggling to hear you. So. You are more than just a DC. Uh, comrade Bia, you are also a father. Comrade Bia, you are six years my senior. Comrade Bia, comrade, to say. In the life of Azania, I just would like to pray morning. We would wake up at four eight. Is encouraging. He say, "Fallen comrades, as we run." But he's saying you can't hear me. I can hear you. Okay, we yeah we can't. We were quite battling to hear the last parts. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. But we okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I was just explaining how good and how inspirational, how motivational he was during our training. Um, we would uh, do our physical training from six, from four to six a.m., and then he will come in from six to eight because that was his space as uh, the chief of logistics to make sure that uh, all of us um, have addressed the stomach issue. We have had our breakfast and then we go refresh. And then we will take our break and then he will come in uh, from uh, eight to 10 and we were doing our production. He was very uh, inspirational during production. Uh, he would move from our horticultural projects, encouraging comrades, move into to our Pigari project where we had our uh, pigs, and he would make sure that all is done and done correctly, and move to our project of uh, chickens and ensure that all is done and done correctly. Um, you will uh, encourage comrades to make sure that they give their all. He was that type of a leader. Uh, he did not lead from behind, he led from the front. Um, and then we will take our break in the afternoon, when we go for our political education classes, that's where he displayed his utmost political maturity. Um, we would uh, engage in discussions on various topics from the national question, uh, ideological questions, uh, looking at uh, the essence of what socialism is, what it means, and then he will uh, use a very simple uh, uh, language and approach using Isikosa to try and explain the big jargons of uh, socialism and communism. Um, politically, he was well-grounded and uh, he was an avid a debater and an avid reader. And we would move from our political classes um, to uh, cultural evenings where we will be singing uh, songs of the revolution, doing poems, doing all. And he will be there, you will pick up, you, you, he will just uh, come through as Google, 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 Google. Uh, I'm sure every cater will remember him with that Google. That Google meant Asieni Emapunui. Um, well, um, in 
in January of 1988, when he became the chief of logistics in the military affairs committee where I was commander, we worked quite close um, in planning our operations. For the first time, um, Azanla got out of the camps into the bush. He was there and he was very inspirational um, as part of the platoon that went into the bush. And then subsequent to that, uh, Comrade Mzuseli had to join the group that uh, went to Libya to, for advanced military training. And when he came back, uh, he came back and he joined us back into the operations. Uh, we went back to the bush. Uh, we had a platoon scattered all over the mountains. When I talk a platoon, I'm talking about 45 uh, cadres. But we had divided them according to their squads and located them in different bases. Uh, along the borderlines. Um, we planned together. Uh, it was uh, Comrade Skab Mutau, myself, and Comrade Mkusin. You'll no commanders plan without their logistics because the chief of logistics makes sure that we get all the resources we need for our operation. Uh, that was his uh, uh, key responsibility. He ensured everyone was well, we have everything we needed for our operations. Uh, we planned operations where we went uh, to attack a farm that was sponsored by the Israelis who were working with the Buputatwana government trying to introduce the concept of the kibbutz, um, which is an Israeli type of cooperatives. Um, we felt that uh, the Israelis were propping up the Bantu stand uh, regime. When we went there, we pulled off that mission and um, we came back. Uh, on our way back, uh, we landed in an ambush, uh, which we countered quickly. It became a skirmish where we all got out scot free. And uh, we moved on, planned other operations to attack the satellite police stations. We moved on uh, to the operation that uh, was the last we had planned. We planned uh, to say now we need to go and break uh, the railway line that links South Africa and Botswana. We sat together, comrades, Cap, comrades, Mtusele and myself, and said, no, if we do that, it will have an impact that um, will get even uh, not only the Buputa Tswana government, the South African government, Botswana government, we will have, it will make that, imp that desired impact. And then um, it was resolved in that meeting that uh, I will go with him to go and check where exactly are we going to um, blow. Uh, the railway line. Um, that evening, we prepared ourselves, took what we needed to take with us uh, for self-defense and for the purposes of our surveillance. And um, it was uh, shortly after Eight that uh, we started to move from our base. 
we moved and we crossed the border uh, not far from Ramatabama border gate and we, we were moving along the railway line where uh, the railway, South African railway had created a foot park, a foot path for maintenance of uh, the railway line. That's where we were moving. And uh, we had agreed that we will move uh, 15 to 20 kilometers inside and then start identifying the joint on the railway line. Um, it was around 3, as 3 a.m. As we were walking, uh, we landed in an ambush. And we just heard them saying, halt, halt. And then um, we quickly tried to turn turned that ambush into a battle. And there was exchange of uh, explosives. We used our grenades, um, which uh, had their own impact uh, because during the trial, I heard that their vehicle was also damaged and there was a big hole. Uh, that uh, had uh, been dug by the explosive where we uh, held the battle. Uh, there was the shooting that was uh, deafening to the ears. Um, well, as per the tradition and the culture, you don't, once you turn an ambush into a battle, you can't do that standing. You go to the ground and, and fire from there. Well, we exchanged fire. They had more firepower. We were just two. They were about a squad. They were 15. Um, I wouldn't tell what happened um, because I never had a chance of going to see him after that battle. Uh, I was captured around half past four in the morning and thrown in the heap. They had called in their reinforcements uh, to the scene. Um, that was the last time we were together. However, well as they were, they wanted to know the, the basis. And then when I said, I don't know any basis, they said, no, let come, let's go show you what will happen to you. The picture I have of him, uh, that he was lying on the floor, full of blood. I could not look at him for long. And uh, I just looked at him. I said, salute from inside. And uh, they pulled me and said, if you don't show us those bases, we will do this to you. No one knows where you are. That was the last time I saw him. That picture, I can't share it. I can't imagine how the family felt when they saw that picture. It was uh, one of the saddest moments that I had to hold 
together to protect those because I knew that he fell fighting, he fell standing. And I said, whatever happens for him, I can't uh, break. He had paid the ultimate price. I would like to call on all of us to say in his spirit, can we take up his guns, his gun, his grenade, and continue with the fight. The fight to restore our humanity. Can we pursue our struggle with the passion and the vigor he displayed to make sure that we realize the socialist Azania he lived and died for. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, comrade uh, Bia, for those um, uh, words. I can understand and imagine uh, how difficult um, you know this last half an hour has been, um, and I can also imagine how difficult the last 30 years have been for you as a person and as his uh, commander general at the time. Comrade uh, Bia, as a result of that incident, the last incident that he just described, he ended up uh, in prison, he ended up spending 57 days of his life without food, without anything, as the system was trying to get information out of him and he never succumbed to the pressure. He almost uh, died. And when the system realized that um, you know, his life was almost giving up, it was then that uh, they um, agreed to, to release him uh, to his family because he could not allow um, his uh, soldier to die in vain. He could not allow uh, an opportunity for other combatants to die because of him. We salute you, Comrade Bia, we salute you, Comrade uh, uh, Keke, and we salute all the fighters of our Zanla forces who stood up and took up arms in the fight uh, for our land, in the fight to liberate uh, the Black Azanians. The struggle continues. That was uh, by way of commemorating the life and times of our Zanla combatant, uh, Comrade Mzwantile Mkosi. We shall be continuing uh, with these commemoration services. The Eastern Cape has a program uh, that is ongoing uh, to continue to commemorate our fallen heroes and bring them to life so that their memory does not fade. We want to thank you for sharing this platform with us. And um, we want to end uh, this commemoration service by way of a poem, and uh, so that you can remember that the struggle continues. Thank you very much for spending the time with us this evening. It's my voice in song and the senior song. That won't be prayed to the winds of the wind, but a song that will remain carved and chiseled on the lapidary spirit that makes us what we are in this wilderness. For we all know that now is the time, now is the hour of the beasts. The green eyed girls that gather to go the going away of a general soul of the beautiful brethren. I have heard many songs in my life. Songs that perished as soon as they knocked from one deep ear to the other. I have heard the people sing to the glory of a God who has one gigantic ear that has never known how to hear. 
I have heard people sing about the children who were mowed down. Like we mowed down lawns and hedges of the bus and his misses in the springtime of our defeat. Children who dropped down as though falling from a great height. Like all those multicolored leaves that they fall down at the ripe autumn that holds no promise to the summer of our victory. We people who have never stopped preparing for our flight in winter, in this hour of the beast, when the green-eyed girls gather to go the going away of a generous soul, of the courageous sister, the children who are singing about were shot down in the midst of winter, and the laden bullets that cut them down were molded, and they came out from the cold hearts of our cowardice. I have heard people sing about the children who were mowed down. I have heard the songs that are sung in whispers about those young maidens of Africa still clad in school uniforms who were first at gunpoint to house the feet of those men whose forebears are past masters at taking the African virginity by force. Those young girls, our sisters, our children, our comrades, who died in their bellies bloated with the filth of the predators, and those who survived to tell the story, and give horrific accounts of these hideous tales. Some bet in their last of savage in the remote corners of the remote villages. Some suffering and told agonies in spinning out the continuation of the creed of men beasts. I have heard the songs that are sung in whispers about those young captive men of Africa, those young men, our brothers, our children, our comrades, whose eyes saw the sodomites ripping open the canals of the evacuation and the blood flowing, trailing down the attenuated manhood of the destroyers. Yes. They dug graves in Avalon and Dorenkov to bury their compatriots, slain in the most one-sided war mankind has ever witnessed. I have heard the people sing about the children who were mowed down. And now we are composing songs about those who were transported thousands of miles cold and naked and dead in cold and naked and dead chains and leg eyes which their captors exhibit in court with a savage glee. Yes, it is time now for them to get their loins. Those green eyed girls who gather to throw the going away of Steve, of Tiro, of my beta. I have heard my keen folks voice stolen by the TV breeze to reverberate against stolid tales that have neither ear for music nor feeling for mourners and were certainly born barren and without the power and without this redoubtable blessing of giving birth and nurturing a new life that will soon be put to the marauding wolves. For it must be certain now, so blessed are those in these hours whose wombs never felt the kick of life. In these hours, when everything alive 
and small and black and beautiful can be plucked like the yellow flowers they pluck every day to decorate the offices that are in fact the death cells of the inquisitors of Babylon, of Luo Corp and John Foster Square. I have heard many songs in my life. Men divested of the last crutch and all qualities that they make people members of the human race. Men robbed of their manhood, singing their leathery faces the race to the bloody sun. Men singing to the accompaniment of the cares and the chain and the gun and the whiplash under the midday sun. Singing these men, these outcasts, singing in the mute cadence of the demand. Their voices trailing and spiraling upwards like a smoke and becoming one with a cloudless sky. These men singing about how they are going to lay down their heavy loads by and by. I have heard our women sing a lullaby, rocking the nameless and the pinkish and the yellow bundle in their arms. A bundle that will in the course of time be transformed into the greenest gin and the launching darkened doorways with the terrible and lustful eyes. And the rumbly belly whose only front is emptiness. And the shriveled body that knows the entrance of a sharp blade. And a bone rattling kick so well, aimed from a heavy boot of the white policeman who will always remain innocent and well meaning until at the end of time. Yes. I have heard the voices of our women singing on grave sites without headstones as they watched the final passage of the young one who has been held into this earth that is only silent in its groaning by our crime of silence. I have seen the faces of my people my people showing curiously shaped scars branded as though with a hot iron on their faces. Is it it any wonder then that our faces are never described positively in that cruel lexicon of our captors? These well-wishing masters who have literally stamped on us, dark brows, such gaping wounds that can never heal. The same men who say they cannot understand what is in fact that we want. What is in fact that weighs heavily like a millstone around the neck of our hearts and our minds. I have watched us, you and me, like a man watching a movie rerun of his twin brothers drowning. I have watched us singing songs to the attainment of our freedom. Our feet raised like one black monument to whatever glories might remain hidden in the cryptic meaning of our past. All of us, the singers and the racers of the feast, wondering at the final meaning of these gestures and these chanted ways. All of us, we the children we met from the same fear womb, thinking, thinking whether we understand the price we have to pay to make concrete these in some ways. This singing is happening now in this hour, before the dawn of the black liberation, 
when the sun is still in deep slumber and the moon is awake and staring with one bright eye. Now I want to sing a song. I want to raise my voice in song and sing a song that won't be prey to the whims of the wind. A song that will still make me want to ask you in this hour when our most beloved brothers are lying naked on the alabaster slabs. Isn't it any time now to stop the green-eyed girls from gathering and voting over the going away of Brother Steve, of Brother Tigo? Isn't it any time now is it any time now? Uh, we thank you uh, for being with us this evening. That was uh, by way of closing this commemoration service, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you very much.